Okay, right. Um, I suggest we, uh, we start. So uh, thank you all for being here today at this uh, press conference. So we'll try to keep uh, the first part short and crispy. And then uh, we'll have lunch just outside here. Um, and then we'll move uh, to the wind tunnel. That's actually, I think, the schedule that most of you have, uh, have seen. First, there's a few presentations by a few different people. You see we have quite uh, the list of um, presenters here. Well, not everybody will actually give part of the presentation, but of course, questions can be directed to any of these. And I would like to briefly introduce the people in front of you. I start with Owen Clifford. He is the spiritual father of this uh, project. So he, uh, he designed it, but he's also um, a top champion in paracycling and uh, an associate professor at the University, National University of Ireland in Galway. Um, then we have um, three other fantastic athletes. Jetze Plat, who's sitting here uh, in front of me. Um, also top Paralympic champion with a, a lot of medals, fourth world, record, uh, world title. And he's also since uh, recently the official holder of the world hour record in hand cycling. And I'm sure that many of you have, uh, have seen that news. So it was also a fantastic performance. And uh, two other uh, top champions in paracycling, uh, Eamon Byrne and Martin Gordon. Um, they uh, compete in uh, tandem cycling. Uh, and actually won uh, quite a lot of medals also recently at, uh, at major uh, events, as you can see here. Um, then we move towards the researchers. The person that did most of the work in this project was uh, Paul Mannion, now Dr. Paul Mannion, because it was his PhD project. Um, and he did that in collaboration with different universities. Then there is uh, Jerry Marshall from uh, ANSYS. He's the, uh, is, um, the global industry director there for sports and um, other important topics. And uh, Ansys is actually the world leader in commercial uh, CFD software, commercial software for this kind of computations. Then there is uh, Guido Vrome sitting here uh, in front of me. Um, he also has quite a lot of uh, uh, items on his CV. He's a sports physician, medical doctor, medical biologist. He's also a specialist in endurance sports. He's actually also the coach of, uh, of Jetsen Blatt. And he's also involved with, uh, with other teams and associations. Then there's Neil uh, Delahaye on, on the other end of the table. He is the national performance coach of Cycling Ireland. And given the fact that Ireland has so many top athletes, uh, that keeps him quite busy. Then uh, Dr. Steffi Gilmeyer, who is uh, sitting next to Paul. She is uh, our expert in wind tunnel testing and meteorology. So she uh, actually practically also runs the wind tunnel, as you will see later. And then finally, there's me. So I'm uh, actually um, working here at this university, also part-time at uh, KU Leuven. I'm specialized in wind engineering and cycling aerodynamics. And in terms of practical cycling, I would say that about 20 years and 20 kilograms ago, I was kind of a mediocre cyclist. Well, nothing compared with these guys. Even 20 years ago, I think I couldn't even keep up with them for a kilometer. But nevertheless, I also liked cycling. So why did we do this project? Well, actually, because uh, Dr. Clifford actually originated it. He, he started this project and asked us to collaborate with him. Um, then uh, together with him, uh, the team was set up. And that's the people actually mentioned here. And then we got, of course, our universities uh, supporting us, but also other important institutions that gave very important support here. So why did we do this project? Well, it's still the case that um, I think there's much more attention to, let's say, the non-paracycling events. Um, while uh, in paracycling, yeah, these athletes are also top athletes, and, and they're actually also competing at the highest level, could also p compete in Tour de France and so on. So I think they deserve also much more attention than is uh, currently given by them, both by the media, but also by, by scientists like us. So what we wanted to do is also support these top athletes with uh, the best scientific research that we can offer them and also to yeah, show the students, especially our students and the wider society, what paracycling is about and how fantastic actually uh, these, uh, these sports and these athletes are. So we're going to focus here on tandem cycling, what you see in the movie on the left. And uh, we're going to focus on hand cycling in the H1, H4 categories. And you see some uh, movies of, uh, of those events. We'll come back to that later. Um, so now I will uh, give the word to our uh, second presenter, which is uh, Thierry Marshall from ANSYS. Please, Thierry. Okay, thank you, Bert, for, for the introduction, and thank you for you to, to be here to the, today. One of the key messages that I would like to uh, deliver coming from the technology is that there is no way to change the world 
or to change your own industry, if you go with traditional me me method, if you ignore this kind of uh, te technology, this is what Tesla has done, going head by head with all the global automotive industry, or what SpaceX, also le led by Elon Musk, was doing to go against uh, Ariane Espace and Na NASA. And we can see that in other industry, like the aeronautic industry. They've been using simulation for close to 50 years because they know that every single part of the uh, airplane need to be modeled in order to improve the performance and to uh, ensure the safety. This has built the success of uh, ANSYS itself, which is a global leader for this kind of uh, simulation. That's not a startup anymore. We start about 50 years ago, and as you can see, we have a target revenue for this year of $1.4 billion and a market cap of $15 billion. Not yet Microsoft and Amazon, but going into this uh, direction. With companies around the world taking advantage of this technology to move further. So one of the questions is why not this kind of uh, uh, sport activity? What we are doing at Antis is to develop engineering simulation software. What is that? This is a science of predicting the behavior of things, anything. It could be solid like this table, it could be a liquid like the air around the, the place, it could be electromagnetic like this uh, microphone, acoustic, uh, uh, optics, uh, and so on. And we do that by solving equation. So let me show you this approach, and I don't want to impress you, neither to scare you with this kind of uh, equation, but just to show you that we are not doing some black magic. We are not just doing some kind of colorful picture for, for that. We are based on this kind of uh, relatively basic equation, which is mass conservation. The fact that, unfortunately, we are not creating material, and we are not losing material. Or energy equation, we are not losing energy, and we are not creating energy. Or the law of Newton. And this equation, will uh, solve them in small cube, because this is much easier to do that. When I say we, that's not correct. Computer we will do that. That's the job of the, the computer, to make sure that we will solve this equation everywhere. And getting some information like velocity, pressure, temperature, stress, not just on this kind of very simplified geometry, but possibly on much more complex geometry that you will see today, or this kind of head of uh, Michael Fels, because he was one of the early spot uh, users of this activity. So moving on, how does this, this work? We are always starting with the athlete. It could be this kind of cyclist here. It could be here like this kind of uh, uh, American football player. And we create some geometry of that. We can add any kind of equipment. Second element is that we need to de describe this athlete, like material properties. It could be the air flowing around the cyclist, or it could be the real soft tissue of the, of the athlete if necessary. And last point is that we need to create a kind of scenario. In this case, we want to analyze how two athletes were heading head to head and to understand what's going on in their brain. If we have that, this kind of geometry, the material properties, and the scenario, we can create this kind of 3D mo model and understand what's going on in the, play, in the head of the athlete to see whether the brain is damaged during the fall or during the, the shock. Well, the success of Francis was coming from the fact that we were uh, aware that we need to consider all these different physics. The solid physics, the fluid physics, like uh, the airflow around all these athletes, the thermal effect, the thermal exchange uh, through the jersey, for example, electromagnetic system, acoustic uh, uh, element. And we were the first company to, to do that, allowing us to grow quite significantly. Some of you can say, hmm, I don't believe you. Come on, this is just something on, on the computer like that. This is nice, colorful picture, but I don't buy it. That's okay. But in this case, don't fly back home. Don't take your car to go back home. Stay away from this uh, computer or from your uh, cell phone there. Uh, otherwise, because all these products have been extensively designed with simulation, and most of them with our own uh, on this, uh, software. Today, this is a reality. Simulation is everywhere, and all the products are used to design that. Even pushing further, the automotive industry, they have got a big revolution, similar to what we are trying to do with sport. Autonomous driving, 
if you want to be safe over there, they're required to drive 10 billion miles to do that. Impossible to do it. It will take a century to do that. So that's why they're doing most of it through a, a simulation, and they cannot ignore this kind of technology. Where is sport again over there? What can we do? Well, look at this automotive industry and the motor sport. When you start to see all this geometry, all this car will penetrate the air and the turbulence behind that, that means that you have a better understanding of what's going on. If you have this kind of understanding, if you have this kind of superpower to see what's going on around the cyclist, you can modify that. And you can see on the top two Ferrari, which were running in uh, Francorchamps here and winning over there, and you see the difference in just one year between the two Ferrari, they're not that big. So is it worth it to do all that just for winning, I don't know what? Well, you can ask the question to the guy who finished second here or there. Yes, any tiny difference is making a, a big difference. Although may I argue, well, we can always do that in the wind tunnel. That's exactly what Cyril Guimard was saying to me during an interview during the last Tour de France. To say, okay, but with Bernard Hinault and Greg Lehmann, we are already doing this kind of wind tunnel testing. The key things that uh, the team of Bert Broken is doing here is that by doing simulation, validated with the wind tunnel. That means that you can do that for every athlete. You don't need to have the athlete in the wind tunnel to do the, the testing because these athletes prefer to, to train rather than, than do, doing that. And therefore, it's possible to make some more progress. Just to illustrate some, uh, some uh, good success here, I know that New Zealand is a very good Paralympic uh, cycling team as well. But look at what they are doing for the team New Zealand in sailing, winning the Ma America's Cup, winning, I should say, crushing their, uh, their competitors' seven to one race in the final. And one of the key elements was to say that you need to take advantage of the aerodynamics. And for example, when they were changing the, uh, the sail and pulling down, it was taking a lot of time. It was not good for aerodynamics. So they were inspired by this guy and would, to say, OK, let's do some cycling. Because if we rotate all the sail, that means that you will be better in terms of aerodynamic, and it will go faster. This kind of small difference in the aerodynamics was allowing them to be completely ahead of the, the curve and winning their last America's Cup. And similarly, when you are looking at the golf ball, Ah, you've got all this small cavity. That's looking nice, but that's not the point. The point is that this small cavity will create some kind of small recirculation, acting like some hook around the uh, boundary layer, and therefore making sure that the ball will penetrate the air much be be better than a very smooth surface of the ball. That could be applied to cycling. And you see here Avanti going all the way to the detail component of the bike, and you see that if you put this component that way, it will perturbate the flow, the airflow here, while a small modification of fit can make a big difference. Saving a few percent, that could be enough <coughs> to win the, uh, the, the situation <coughs> and win the race. And it could be not just for this uh, top elite athlete, it could be for all of us. Look at uh, what Decathlon is do doing, just modifying some component here by doing some simulation, making sure that they can change the geometry, reducing the mass, and therefore improving the, the, the performance, reducing the stress, but increasing the, the stiffness. For any kind of bike, and I'm very proud that, uh, to own this kind of bike to, to do some cycling. I'm doing a little bit of cycling myself as well, but not uh, at the level of this guy. So very quickly, that's the point. All what Bert and others will be presenting you today is not black magic. It's really science and technology. It's computer model and the, the computer over there. This is some technology that we see in a pervasive way across all the industry, including the healthcare industry. And so if today, this top elite artist still have the, the advantage to have a competitive advantage by using simulation, what I have seen in other industry, and that I'm sure I will see in the sport industry as well, is that very soon, not using simulation, will be a competitive disadvantage because everybody will take advantage of that. And this is just like I was saying with Tesla and SpaceX. Nobody can ignore the technology if you want to be a winner and if you want to change your discipline. Thank you.
very briefly something about the methods we have used before we uh, move actually towards the presentation of uh, Dr. Clifford. Then, um, like Terry just said, eh, in, in cycling, and you want to focus on cycling aerodynamics, uh, you could do testing in real life. Uh, you can uh, monitor the speed and the pedaling frequency and the power output of these uh, of these two Dutch tandem athletes in this case, um, and then actually try to um, yeah try to analyze that, try to improve it that way. Another approach, uh, also one that actually Terry briefly mentioned, is testing in a wind tunnel. That's what you will see later. Uh, so later today, yesterday actually we tested uh, Eben and Martin uh, in the wind tunnel, and you'll also get the footage of that. And today we'll test uh, Jets in the wind tunnel. So the wind tunnel actually in this channel you create, and here actually you see Eben and, and uh, Martin being tested. You create actually a, a yeah a controlled airflow, and you actually measure the air resistance of the athletes. And finally, then there's a third option. And the third option is what Jerry explained and what we uh, are working together with ANSYS for. And that's this computer simulation. And that's actually, um, it's not black magic like Jerry said. It's actually something that allows you to see things that otherwise you would not be able to see. For example, um, here you see the wind speed around a cyclist followed by a motorcycle. And only if with this kind of simulations you would look at pressures, you would see why indeed the first cyclist would have a benefit from a motorcycle riding behind him or her. And that's because you see this red area of overpressure actually pushing the, the athlete forward. You can also use this kind of simulations to um, disprove some statements. For example, like the statement that this particular descent position by Chris Froome in 2016 was aerodynamically superior to others, and which afterwards we could show with wind tunnel testing and with computer simulation that it was not. Um, and you can analyze, for example, the aerodynamics in, in a full peloton. And also there, wind tunnel tests can be done, but also computer simulation. And here you see the wind flow. Uh, in half of uh, such a peloton with uh, the strong wind speed indicated in orange and the lower wind speed in uh, in blue color. So now, um, um, without further delay, I will give the word to uh, Dr. Clifford. Thanks, Bert. So <coughs> um, I'm just going to spend a few minutes just talking you through um, what is paracycling, just introducing it to you and hopefully uh, introducing you also as to why you should pass, why you should be interested in it. Um, right, we don't need that. So there's, I suppose, four, four basic types of events in uh, paracycling, and they run from uh, athletes on the top left who cycle on solo bikes. So that would have been someone like me. My own condition, I have a muscle wasting condition. And on the top right, you have tandem athletes such as Eamon and Martin that you see over there. Eamon and Martin are actually a sprint bike and um, you would have also endurance bikes. On the bottom left, you have athletes to compete on tricycles because they just don't have the balance. They have various conditions where they don't have the balance to actually be able to ride a solo bike. And on the bottom right, you have hand cyclists. And hand cyclists typically are in, the athlete you see there is actually Alex Zanardi, and he's in uh, a kneeler uh, type of hand cycle, or they can be in recumbent frame, which you'll see later on with uh, Yetze. Across all these uh, four disciplines, athletes are divided based on the type of disabilities they have. So you're competing against athletes with disabilities that are uh, similar to your own. So just who are we? Um, you know, there's a lot of different types of athletes take, um, I suppose, compete in paracycling. And someone like me, for example, I have a genetic condition. I can ride against able-bodied riders and have done so for a long time. But because of my condition, I can, I'm also um, able to compete in paracycling. Um, on the top left, there's an athlete, actually a Belgian athlete, who I competed against for quite a number of years, the Dietrich uh, Schelfoot. So he was involved in an accident as a young rider. He was actually a stagiaire with quick step at the time, and he was involved in a very bad accident. And that uh, obviously ended his professional career, but he has since continued as a paracyclist. Sarah's story would be a British athlete who would be very well known, Rafa Wilk was a former motor, uh, motocross GP rider. He's now a hand cyclist. You see him in the top right. Again, he was involved in an accident and he was paralyzed after the accident. And now he's one of the top athletes in um, his category. Alex Zanardi is a name that you might know because uh, he was a Formula One uh, driver. And uh, quite a number of years ago, again, he was involved in an accident and now he competes in uh, paracyclist and he's being very successful. And I mentioned Christina Vogel only because she said this recently herself in an interview. Uh, she had a very unfortunate accident. As you might know, she's a German track sprinter. 
a hugely successful German track sprinter, and she recently had a very unfortunate accident in the velodrome and is now being left paralyzed. And she indicated that paracycling might be an outlet for her to continue competing at the top uh, level. So it's different types of athletes with different types of disabilities, but all of them competing and training uh, at the top uh, level. So just is, is our people interested in it? Well, people are definitely um, more interested in it and it is becoming um, more popular and the level is absolutely uh, becoming, uh, I suppose, very high. You can just see the comparisons there between London and Rio. For example, the, the actual busiest day between the Olympics and, Par and Paralympics in Rio was one of the Paralympic uh, days. So 170,000 people uh, entered the Barra uh, Olympics Park during one of the um, Paralympic days, and that was actually the busiest single day of the entire Rio Olympics. The cumulative TV audience, believe it or not, and this is uh, based on one-minute viewing figures, was actually higher for the Paralympics than the Olympic Games in 2016. So you can see that it is becoming very uh, uh, important, it is becoming very popular with people. And I mean, a number of companies have said that it is, um, I'm just taking this quote from the BP Global Director, but I could have taken a number of others. And in this case, he says that sports best kept, uh, kept secret in terms of sponsorship opportunities. So it's increasingly being seen as a sport where people need to start paying attention and they need to start paying attention to the athletes also. So the question though is really, are we any good? I mean. Okay, fair enough, it's, it's nice and, you know, obviously I'm biased, I'm interested in it, but are we really any good as athletes? So, um, unfortunately, I'm going to uh, steal a little bit here with Yetze, and I can tell you I definitely can't push a thousand watts with a sprint, and Yetze here can push a thousand watts with his arms, not to mind his legs. Um, for example, my, the winning uh, speed for me in the time trial in Rio, um, in the Paralympics, was 47 kilometers an hour, over 30 kilometers which even for an able-bodied cyclist will be, I know, to be uh, very impressive. Um, can you, for example, push 170 kilos? In fact, those, those two riders are actually more than 170 kilos combined from a standing start around a track in under one minute. So the power output of those two track sprinters in uh, the tandem, they're the current world champions, the British team, um, is just absolutely phenomenal. I mean, either one of them would make good sprint riders in themselves and many of the um, sprint bikes contain on the front of the bike, which is a sighted pilot, contain um, professional or former professional athletes. So I think you should be interested in it because I think the performances are incredible and because the athletes are training at that. If you want to win a medal in paracycling at world championships or in the Paralympics, you need to be a full-time athlete training uh, in the same way as any full-time athlete would. Uh, just some other examples, which I think for me are equally astonishing. On the right-hand side, there's a Spanish competitor who's been competing in what's called the, the C1 category. It's the most uh, disabled category for cyclists who cycle a solo bike. And he regularly, with one arm and one leg, does three or four hour training spins at 30k an hour. Now, most people I know with two arms and two legs wouldn't even get close to that. He's an absolutely incredible athlete. Someone like him would be an incredible athlete um, regardless. If he was fully able-bodied, he would also be. There's a Chinese track sprinter, a woman from a standing start who can do 500 meters in 43 seconds with one leg. Again, I would invite anyone to go up on the track tomorrow and try and do that. And I'm sure that many people wouldn't do it from a standing start. And again, just the duration, the amount of training uh, in, you know, for hand cycling or for any of the disciplines is just enormous. So in order to win, you have to be full-time, and you have to train exactly in the same way as a professional, any other professional athlete would. And again, I just want to just emphasize that, uh, you know, I raced for a long time against uh, able-bodied racers, racers, and I also obviously in the last maybe six, seven years raced as a paracyclist, well, even less in the last four or five years. And I absolutely needed to up my game in terms of training to be able to stay at the top of the of paracycling. Everything from nutrition, um, we looked at you know everything from my training plans, rest, recovery, and of course you don't always do things right, but you continuously try and develop these things. But the one common thing across all paracyclists is that they uh, all have a lot of physical talent. You cannot get to the top level of this without being physically very uh, talented and you cannot get to the top level without um, being uh, professional. But I guess just to lead into this study, why we were interested in doing this study was that 
while I do think a lot of the other areas of power cycling have been addressed or are being addressed and innovated on in recent years, everything from training programs to strength and conditioning to nutrition, the same way as they would be for any other athlete. The issue of aerodynamics was one issue when, you know, over the last number of years, I suppose, because I work in a university, I became curious as to whether there had been a lot of work done looking at aerodynamics, particularly of hand cycles and tandems. And we found that there had been little or no uh, work done publicly on this. And I think that was the genesis of the project. And I think one of the key things uh, that excited me about the project as well is that paracycling throws up questions that we'll say able-bodied or solo cycling just does not throw up. And things like, for example, a tandem has two riders in close proximity to each other. That throws up a lot of technical challenges in modeling that you don't get even with a team pursuit in uh, cycling. Uh, tricycles and hand cycles have three wheels, which again, perhaps some of the assumptions we make about two-wheeled bicycles don't necessarily apply to uh, three-wheeled bicycles. And we're only starting to understand that. And I show one of my uh, key competitors actually on the top, an American, very good character called Joe Berenyi who's a track uh, sprinter. Again, I think the world record for the kilo he does is 105, I believe, for a standing start. He has one arm, so he can't, get out, he can't actually get out of the gate. Um, he has to see, stay seated um, getting out of the gate, and it's just a phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal time. But what is the impact aerodynamically of having one arm? What is the impact of having prosthetics? And how do these impact, or should these impact, uh, the design, future design of frames and bicycles? So these are just some of the questions which we have started answering, but it, these are a lot of these questions remain unanswered, and that's something we hope to um, be able to answer over the coming years. So thank you very much, and I'll hand back to Bert. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Owen. Um, now um, I will give the floor to uh, Dr. Hido Vroon. Well, thank you very much for uh, the invitation here. I'm very happy to, um, to tell a little bit of a story uh, about Jetsa and me. Um, what, uh, who am I? Well, um, I, uh, I'm a doctor. Um, I studied um, first medical biology in the uh, University in Utrecht um, with interest in exercise physiology. But during that study, I, um, um, I also didn't want to end up in um, in some kind of laboratory setting. I just wanted to work with athletes. Um, and that's why I became uh, interested in uh, becoming a sports physician, studied medicine, um, and became a sports physician. I have my own performance lab here in the Netherlands, in Amersfoort. Um, and from my own background as a um, uh, triathlete, my, my uh, expertise is endurance sports. Um, and what I try to do with my, uh, the athletes that I train and coach and test is um, to make them stronger and faster. That's my, my, my duty, what I want to do. Jets is one of my uh, athletes, um, um, and he's a very special athlete. Um, I don't treat him different than uh, a normal cyclist or a normal triathlete just the way uh, every other triathlete and, and cyclist uh, is trained, I, uh, I train him too. I don't um, uh, spare him and, and let him do less. Um, he can suffer as much as anyone, uh, and as a world champion, even more. Um, he wins a lot. You can see his uh, world championships, hand cycling, Paralympic ch champion um, in triathlon. Um, world champion in triathlon many times, and also now world record holder. And now we're heading for Tokyo 2020. And what I want to tell you about is uh, the story about the, the world hour record. It was March 13, we did that. And the, play, the plan to, um, to attack that world record became in the winter of 2017. So Jetsi came to me and told me his plan and he wanted to break the world record because he thought well, he could do that. It, at that time, the world record was at 42 kilometers um, and 165 meters. 
And just to, uh, to get the, the 2018 season good, uh, have a good start, he thought, well, it would, it would be fun to do the world hour record there. So when we have to start building a plan, um, and um, the first thing we did is um, make a training plan, and we started in January training on the track. What I wanted to do is increase his functional threshold power, so the power that he can maintain for 45, 60 minutes at highest level. If I can increase that to the highest possible level for that time, that would be very good. And then the other thing is to decrease his resistance on the bike. As a result, he had the highest performance, so the highest speed. This is um, the training plan for the, the last three months we did. See, we bu I'm building up his, uh, his training load, and there's a peak here where he's um, on a training camp on Lanzarote. So there's much better weather than here. Uh, so he can do also much more training load. Um, he did even... Uh, uh, one day he did the Ironman course there, the 180 kilometers, because he just would uh, he liked it. Uh, he liked it, and uh, it would be a fun day. That's he. <laughs> um, and it's it's a good um, uh, week to build up his uh, his aerobic performance. Back there, he, we got back to the schedule, and then every week. At least one time, sometimes he went there two times a week, two hours training on the track. And every training I build up some more interval blocks at the, uh, uh, the, the power that he would have to produce at the world hour record. In total he had ten training sessions on the track where we did those power testing pro, uh, uh, blocks, five minutes, ten minutes, twenty minutes. And also we did some error testing. You know, we had a mobile testing unit from Nocio Connect. You can see it a little bit over there on the picture. It's a small device. Um, and just to um, try to get a figure of the CDA value on his bike. And about his bike, because we had the plan already made up in, in uh, um, October, Jetze went to Denmark, to Walternus, and they built a, a brand new bike for him for the, for the world hour record. It's about 12 kilograms. The gear he rode is 53 times 14. He started with 15, but that was too small, because then the, the cadence was too high for him. He, with a speed of 45 kilometers an hour, he, uh, it was about 100 uh, uh, RPM, so we got 53.14, then it would be about 95. That's better for him. The wheels, you see, it uh, had two spokes. We have uh, um, a, uh, a good, he raced already with the, in the TT tra time trials with those wheels, so he had a good feeling with those. And we tested them also on the track in Alkmaar. Uh, so we chose for that because that was, had a good feeling and also good results. He had the gas uh, tubes and also he's also every training we do on a power meter because that's what I give him uh, a training plan on power and he communicates back with we, uh, to me with a file and I can very good with my data analysis program see how he's developing in his functional threshold power. Well, the race itself, the plan was to, um, to go on with a power plan of 230, 240 watts. That's what, um, when I go back to the first screen, this one is the power duration curve of Jetze from the last three months. My software can calculate what he can produce. It's time to exhaustion. 
and he was here at 259 watts for 33 minutes. So that's 33 minutes. That's not an hour. So I had to go, uh, um, decrease that power for 5, 6%. And then I came to the, uh, um, the power plan with an upper limit of 240. The, the environmental status, the environmental situation was, it was 20 degrees, approximately, on the track. They put up the heat there because we asked for that. Um, it was a hundred, uh, it was a thousand uh, a barrel pressure. And we had a measurement with the mobile device, which was from that point out, it was point, uh, 0.173. So I'm very curious what it will be in the wind tunnel this, this afternoon. The result of the, of the race was that he um, finally, at the end of the hour, he rode 44,749 meters. So that's um, 10 laps more than the former world hour record. And that was huge, because, and the power he produced over the hour was 228 watts. You can see in the, uh, in the graph here, the uh, purple lines, that's the power, because it's on a track, you can see in the curves, there's higher power, and on the uh, long ends, when he's coming out of the curves, there's much less power. So you can't push a, s a stable power on the track. That's what we have to all correct for then, but when you see on the, the green line and there's also below that a red line, that's his heart rate, it's as flat as it can be, it's a machine. All the, all the, uh, the laps, the first lap he started, because he starts from still stand, was 26 seconds. The next lap was already, because he wants to gain time then, the first laps, it was below 19, and all laps after that were let's say between 19.5 and 20.4, all of them. So it was like a machine, um, and it was really great success that we had um, with um, attacking the world for our record, and I bet no one can beat it in a short time, unless he do, does it his, himself. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh Guido, uh, very nice uh, presentation. Um, so now I think it's, uh, it's time to move towards the, the results of this project. And we actually have, uh, have four. And before we actually present those results, and, and uh, Paul will start doing that, um, just very briefly want to mention you that uh, in data, also in, in paracycling, it's seconds that matter and sometimes tenths of a second. And these are data, actually, that, uh, that Owen uh, dug up. If you look, for example, at the Rio Paralympics, uh, in the tandem cycling for the men in the four kilometer pursuit, difference between gold and silver was 1.6 seconds, and between silver and bronze was only 0 0.9 seconds. So it's really um, details that, that can matter here. Uh, these are not differences like, for example, the Etsy's World Hour record that, that was uh, yeah, won by a landslide. But sometimes here, you can see differences are extremely small. 0 0.067 seconds this year, um, on the Tech World Championships with the, with the women. And that's over 30 kilometers. So that's uh, quite an important difference between uh, silver and bronze there. Um, and you also see that with hand cycling, that sometimes uh, differences are less than a second. So seconds do matter. Uh, and that's actually what uh, yeah, we focused on in this project. How can we, by scientific knowledge, gain seconds? And I would like to invite uh, Dr. Paul Mannion now to explain the first uh, two major outcomes of this project. Please, Paul. So when we first started the project, um, we found that uh, there was a couple of different ways we could approach it. One was uh, wind tunnel um, experiments and also CFD simulations. And uh, so when we first approached uh, tandem cycling, um, there are a lot more unique positions that can be adopted um, com by comparison to, let's say, your solo cycling. 
Um, this is because you have two athletes on a single bicycle, so there's a lot more variation that you can have. So we started investigating um, several different uh, positions and postures that they were able to adopt. One that was very unique was called the flame, flame clench position. So this is where the athlete on the back, who's called the stoker, doesn't actually hold the handlebars, but can actually hold onto the frame in front of him instead. So effectively, he's able to uh, tuck in his arms out of the, the airflow, and we were able to reduce the aerodynamic drag, or the CDA. We found that this was actually a more effective position for time trials, and that they were able to save up to 8.1 seconds over 10 kilometers. Uh, we then also were investigating for um, hand cycles. So uh, one of the optional positions that you can adopt is your arm crank position. So this is something when you're in a descent going down a very steep hill, um, you can reach a terminal velocity where you might not actually want to actually output any, any more power, where you'd try to adopt the most aerodynamic position that you can to try and achieve your fastest velocity. Here we found that actually a position called the nine o'clock position. So this is where your arms are most outstretched in front of you. It was actually preferable to what we found was the most commonly used uh, six o'clock position, which is actually a lower position where the arms are, are pushed as low as they can go on the crank. Here, we were able to find that over a 500 meter descent, you could save up to 0 0.8 seconds. And uh, this is purely just by adopting a different arm crank position. So it's something that any athlete can adopt. And uh, so now I'm going to pass you on to back to the course. OK, thank you very much, Paul. So you, you see indeed that uh, yeah, these time differences are already very close or even above the, the differences that co sometimes can be uh, decisive. So uh, we have four major outcomes. So I would like to show you the, the third one. So here you see um, the World Championship road race. And if you look at these hand cycles and you look at the wheels, you see that some riders have disc wheels at the, at the rear. Others have not, like, for example, Jetsen. He did not do that. Um, I think he can explain later why he did not do that, but actually he was, he was right to do that. And if you see him winning this particular stage, he certainly did not win it on aerodynamics. I think he also won it by a landslide, but in some other cases, the aerodynamics can be decisive. So indeed, you see that many different riders use all kinds of different wheels, with sometimes also different wheel diameters. And the question then is which ones actually, or which combination is the best? And from those that we tested, we actually found something that is quite counterintuitive. Hey, you would see that many riders, many researchers, even scientists, would say, OK, you need to use disc wheels. Disc wheels are better, and, and they are, if you test them as a wheel alone, um, or in, in the bicycle alone. But if you combine them with the rider, you see a different effect. And the effect is actually um, a bit simply illustrated here. So the left the disc wheels, on the right the spoke to wheels. And what you see here actually in blue is the suction that is acting on the helmet and the back of the rider. So what happened there actually with the disc wheels is that the flow is forced between these wheels because of the discs, the plates, and it actually creates a bit more suction on the rider. Um, and that can actually give you, uh, so not using disc wheels, like most athletes would do, but using spoke wheels could give you an advantage of uh, up to 1.6 seconds on one kilometer. And that's also actually quite uh, quite a lot. So this is certainly something that is very um, against the intuition of uh, most athletes and, and scientists. So for the last finding, I would like to give uh, the word back to uh, Dr. Clifford. So the last finding, uh, significant, or well, we'll say the last of the four findings we're going to present, uh, where, where we looked at the relative positions in a tandem uh, bike between the stoker, or which is the visually impaired athlete on the back of the tandem, and the pilot, which is the athlete on the front of the tandem. So we were looking how, uh, relative to each other, what angles should our body be at. And I suppose the key finding was, and it's again, uh, maybe considered counterintuitive, was that higher stoker uh, torso angles impacted drag um, a lot more than the pilot operate, uh, adopting high torso angles. So what we're saying is that it is preferable for the pilot, the rider in the front, to be at a slightly higher torso angle because, in effect, they shade the stoker, the rider behind. And when we looked at that, we found that the optimal uh, combination uh, was approximately 25 degrees for the pilot and 20 degrees for the stoker in a time trial position. 
which would benefit, uh, have a benefit of about 6.5 seconds over 10 kilometers, which again, from my own experience as a solo cyclist, is uh, an enormous gain. And to try and get these types of gains uh, you know, through additional training, of course, would be um, extremely difficult. Right, so we are, we are already approaching the end of the, the presentations, um, which means that I have to thank everybody for really keeping, uh, keeping the time. I want to, uh, before uh, we uh, start the round of questions, I want to thank, of course, all the people present here, but also especially the people that are not uh, necessarily sitting at this table and that helped a lot in uh, preparing movies and, and the material that you, by the way, find on the, the USB stick from answers that you got from Thierry. So Thijs, Fabio, many thanks. Um, Steffi, Geert, Jan, Alessio, Jan Diepenstaan van Asten. Of course, our secretary, office ladies, Leontine and uh, Natalie. And then, of, of course, also the media teams. And now it's time for questions. Just, just one question in general. By um, coming out with this uh, data and results, you're losing the edge to the competitors. Uh, how does that work in your line of sport? Uh, yeah, I, I, to a certain extent, I agree. I think I think what we're trying to do, though, is maybe equalize things a little bit in that some uh, nations have the budget and capacity to spend enormous amounts of money on aerodynamics research and have done that for paracycling, whereas others can't. So at least by making uh, results publicly available, we give uh, different countries, you know, this, uh, approximately the same starting point. What I would say is that what you need to do then is you need to take these results and you need to look at the individual riders you have. And of course, there's where you'll start to gain uh, some more seconds again by modeling and doing wind tunnel testing on individual riders. But from my point of view, I guess, as a researcher in university, I think it is very important that we enable as many athletes as possible to gain uh, from the results of these projects. Maybe a comment that I could add that we are seeing in other industries that not, it's not because they are sharing some information about uh, past research that they are not doing some ongoing research. And therefore, they are still uh, one or two years ahead of the, the, the competition. I think it's nice to, to share what they have learned for, from the, the past. But indeed, it's very important to keep uh, doing some uh, research. And there are plenty of uh, open research that uh, we are not commenting uh, today, which is on ongoing. And, and maybe indeed something to add in addition to that, like like Owen already suggested, is um, that um, well, as far as we know, this is the first publicly communicated research on, on paracycling. And, and but probably there has been done already much more, but it's been kept confidential. Uh, and I think that's indeed the difference that we, that we have here with this project. And of course, with you present here. So I think people or uh, athletes uh, watching the media, at least your media, will certainly have a benefit in the, in the upcoming races. Yeah, um, Steve Casty from PC Pro. Um, and I'm very interested in how this is a much more democratic movement than big cycling teams and, and Sky with big long coaches, all that kind of. This is this is a small scale uh, interest. Um, and my own experience with with both people in you know, with disabilities and what they do with cycling is that it's not so much the sportsman, it's the regular guy who doesn't think he can exercise again that benefits from, from, from these processes. Is there any way that people can gain benefit from this without a cray and a whole bunch of software and some professors? Is, is there, a, a, is there a, a, a grassroots use for this research? Um. Like I guess one of the reasons for starting the projects in, in to a certain extent there was obviously the, the performance gains to be had by we'll say the elite athletes at that end of it. But I think also projects like this, I mean, for example, I'm a member of a cycling club back in Ireland. I, you know, obviously go uh, train, etc. And most of my a lot of the, the guys maybe race but only at a national level, etc. But they're hugely interested in our aerodynamics and the constant technological evolution gets people into cycling. It gets more people on the bike and it gets people moving from maybe recreational cycling to maybe training a bit more. I think, like for me personally, by maybe democratizing this, as you use that word, but this type of research a little bit, is 
it gets the sport more publicity and I think for people with disabilities it gives them, yes there is a sport with an outlet, it is a sport where you know you can push yourself to the limit where you will get the best scientific sport. But even I think just for uh, you know kids in schools etc with disabilities, I really think that uh, seeing a sport being exposed to I suppose this type of research encourages them just to get involved in sport. You know, I, I think it says, yeah, you know, this is important, this is interesting, this is something people care about, and uh, I guess for me it's important. I, I don't want to put uh, Neil's uh, foot, but I might just a ask, because from a development side point of view, because Neil is a uh, psych Ireland's national performance coach, and just in terms of helping develop athletes, maybe there's something there on that. I think you're right. It's an astute observation in relation to able-bodied elite and paracycling elite. Uh, paracycling holds more of an ethos around sport and participation is maybe more of an aspect as well. But I think this sort of research, at a glance, even from some of the diagrams that are up there, your hobby cyclist, your leisure cyclist is going to learn something straight away. Immediately, a torso angle, easily adjusted. A hand cyclist extending their arm on a descent. That's something at a glance that someone can implement straight away that's uh, different from what has been utilized before. So I think there's snippets there for everybody, whether uh, para or otherwise. And I do think it's opening a door of information that people can start getting a handle on it a little bit. Um, it's not as intimidating maybe as somehow uh, as how information could be presented on the sports science side on the able-bodied. I think it's been presented in a way that people can readily get something from it and at a glance make changes to their own setup or to their own bike that will make them go faster for sure. And I have to say that uh, there is no free lunch except for, for today uh, in the sense that um, you need to invest uh, a little bit. Democratization is something very important. For example, indeed, if people need to uh, uh, get access to software like ANSYS and learn how to, to use them and so on, it will take them quite a lot of time. So we need to find a way to make them available to other people. To, well, anybody can start creating some computer model. The question is to see whether this will be giving some good results. So that's why when I say there is no free lunch, we try to communicate as much as possible. I would encourage anyone to come to see Bert or other people who've got this kind of experience. Spend maybe half a day with him and see how they can find some agreement. The difference today is that this is available to any a team in the world compared to when Cyril Guimard was doing that with Bernard Hino and Greg LeMond 20 years ago. It was only one or two or three in the world who were able to do that. Today it's a question of scanning the, the athlete and uh, addressing the, the, the position. So I think that everybody, every team can, can do that. But to be honest, yes, you still need to do some investment, a little bit of time, a little bit of uh, uh, contacting the, the, the right people for, 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 for that. Not buying expensive software, not learning all this uh, complex uh, software, but working with, with the right people. And I think, and excuse my language, I think if, if you would show this footage or uh, to a scientist, they would say, yeah, you, you've raped the project. And because actually what we did is now summarizing the work that Paul did over three and a half years and written in a book of almost 400 pages. We put it actually in four small headlines. But, but you're absolutely right. This is also the way indeed to, to try to de democratize it. Yeah. Hi. I was just wondering, is this now the end of your project or will you Will, will you, do you already see possibilities in the future to push it even further to be, again, that one-tenth of a second extra faster? Yeah, that's, that's a also a very good question. Um, I think there's, uh, yeah, there's still, uh, these are just two flavors, I think, uh, of, of the paracycling. So there's still other uh, parts of paracycling that could be explored. But even then, I think, um, and, and Paul also has, has um, I think, devoted a, a chapter on that uh, that was actually quite extensive one on all the things that still could be done uh, because this is actually just lifting the, the tip of the veil. Um, so yeah, I think in, in, in terms of practical items, uh, Owen mentioned a few, if you want to focus on on cyclists with prosthetics, uh, cyclists for example with one arm, like, like Owen showed on the, you get a completely different um, aspect of aerodynamics than involved. And that also would justify completely different investigation. So I think it would be for us the challenge to find again funding to do this kind of project. And, and then hopefully to continue as, as soon as possible.
Yeah, I mean, of course, I'm completely biased because I'm involved. I was involved in the sport, and I'm, you know, still, uh, oh, I suppose, retired from competition, but still train, etc. And, um, and my remit in university, of course, is to re research. So I'm biased every way. But I think this is uh, really opening a kind of a Pandora's box. I mean, in my head, there's hundreds of additional questions, and there's a lot of additional gains that can be made for athletes. And even yesterday, we were testing the. Um, Irish sprint by um, uh, tandem uh, with Martin and Eamon and I think we only scratched the surface of what we could do there and in their competitions they're looking for tenths of seconds that's what they need at this stage you know and uh, I, I just think we've um, I think there's actually a lot more that can be done here and a lot more interesting work that can be done here than in um, the professional uh, able-bodied scene for example, because there are just so many variabilities or variables here that don't occur in that scene. Yeah, along this line, uh, maybe a, a comment. Uh, we are very, very far away for fi from finding the perfect position that every single athlete will be uh, using. As uh, Ergan was mentioning, there are so many uh, variables. On the other hand, there is something I, I don't understand. We've got uh, Ireland here. They are top performer over there. But I'm from Belgium. Bert is from Belgium. What are we doing over there? We are in a Dutch university. Why the, this government are not realizing that, uh, that there is a very good solution here that could improve the, the performance of their the athlete and making sure that we are winning more medals for that? That's coming back to the funding. Well, not a lot of funding for, uh, for activity like that, but at least the support that the different government, different federation can bring to this kind of researcher in cooperation with the, the, the athlete. This is something's missing. We have so many questions that we can address, and we know that we have the technology to, to address that, that other industry are, are doing. So I'm always a little bit surprised that we are not taking more uh, advantage of this kind of uh, approach and getting more PhD students like that Paul is uh, uh, leading to make sure that we, are, we can uh, address some of the, this uh, question and keep improving the, the, the performance. In some group, they are doing it. We've got the USA cycling team visiting us here in Eindhoven uh, a few months ago. You see the, the result in, uh, in England and, and so on. Why not the, the other group? It's certainly a good question. And some of the questions that we uh, discuss, were discussing earlier, what about the UCI? There is some technology which is there, which is clearly giving some strong competitive ad advantage. Why not regulating that? And to some extent, we are not opposed to any kind of regulation. To the contrary, we said that there is a great technology here we need to regulate. Otherwise, it could be open to any kind of uh, uh, direction that we might be modifying the body and, and so on. Let's make sure that uh, everybody is paying attention to that and uh, we are doing it in a very fair play in the future. Okay, other questions? Uh, it's very interesting noticing those national differences because to my mind, um, there's an empty seat here, which is the regulators of cycling. And the problem for, for you and us and, and a number of other people is that they're based in France and it's a very French-focused interest. Um, I don't get the sense that there's such a, a regulator enforcement in, in Paralympic cycling, but that's got to change, surely. They're, those guys are, are going to come up with some rules, um, such as they are. Um, are you constrained by what they're telling you to do? What happens with the, the relationship when you say, I'm doing this research, hello, Mr. Regulator, this is what you should know? Um, and, and is that a good conversation, or is it like the, the, the traditional cycling problem in France where you know, recumbents were banned from the Tour de France because they were too useful, that kind of difficulty arising in, in conventional cycling? What happens with the well, Paralympics? I would say that to have a conversation, you need to have two people. And so far, I've got the feeling that we are still alone. You're perfectly right to say that there is an empty seat here. But we invite them. And I know that uh, Ergan was uh, a third king to, to them. Uh, they didn't say that, uh, they didn't push back to say, OK, no, we, we don't want to come uh, here. They've got other uh, priority. That's not the first time when we discover and when, in fact, Bert found out from simulation that the car behind the cyclist was pushing the cyclist and giving some kind of unfair competitive. Same with the, the, the motorbike and so on. We wrote some letter to the UCI to let them know about that. And uh, I think that the first time we received a polite letter to say, okay, thank you for letting us know about that. 
and nothing happened, and the second letter we didn't receive a anything. Let me tell you a story about uh, swimming, in the sense that we start uh, working with the USA si uh, swimming team in uh, the year 2002, something like, like, like that, designing the Speedo swimsuit. And uh, everything was going very well, and we let the FINA aware of that, didn't pay attention to that, until the Beijing Olympic, when about, I think it was 85% of the gold medals and the record were broken by people wearing this kind of swimsuit. The other athletes were not linked to this uh, uh, brand. We were complaining about that, and they said, okay, we want to wear the same equipment. And they said, okay, no, you have a contract with the, the other brand, so you cannot do that. So there were a big reaction from the athlete uh, themselves, and the FINA had to start to, to regulate, to pre prevent the, the kind of full uh, swimsuit. That's why, uh, in, before the, this uh, discussion, we uh, got a meeting with Organ to say, okay, let's keep pushing with UCI. Uh, inviting them, but also telling them that we want to meet them. Uh, we want to let them know about what, what, what's going on. After that, this is their decision, whether they regulate or, or not. We are open to, uh, to, to regulation, but this is their uh, decision. We don't want them to come to us in uh, three, four, five years to say, okay, but why you didn't mention that? No, there are some advantage. We are fully aware that this technology can bring some very key advantage, up to the point that maybe some people can claim that the, the, the rates are not unfair. We keep communicating about that so that everybody knows, and indeed the regulator should know about that and take that into account. Right, again. Yeah, I, I agree. I think and I think that's part of why we we wanted to make you know as much as this research public as possible is because it does um, at least level the playing field a little bit. Albeit there are a lot of other questions we have to answer, and I think absolutely uh, in general research like this should engage with uh, the regulators, um, such as in this case it will be the UCI. And you know we're very hopeful. I would be very hopeful that they will be open to engaging with the, us in in the future. And it's purely just to to inform us to what's going on, so that they can make decisions based on uh, best science. I mean, one of the you know issues such as, uh, for example, classification in Paralympics Ireland. How do you classify athletes into very various um, disability um, levels? So there, you know, this is a, a science, but there's also a lot of judgment calls made in this. And I think even our aerodynamics could be part of this uh, process because. Uh, for example, you know, even in, in my category, you might compete against uh, an athlete who has, for example, two prosthetic legs from the knees down. So those legs could be essentially very aerodynamic. Now, I have, I'm, not, I'm not saying I have any problem in this, uh, in, in this particular case, but it, I think it's very useful for the UCI to, to um, understand what is the relative advantage. And there can be some advantages of one athlete having a prosthetic and one athlete maybe not having a prosthetic for whatever reason. And just to, again, to try and make it such that medals are uh, awarded because of athlete talent and because of athlete work. And one other thing I would say is that, you know, this, this process of aerodynamics is not easy. So we suggest to an athlete, you change your torso angle, you do this, you do that. But the athlete then has to go and do it. They have to train in those positions. They have to be able to output power in those positions. So it's not a free lunch. You know, we give them the information, but the athlete then sti still needs to have the talent to implement that. So even if someone like m myself or Yetzir, the guys, actually discover ways of becoming more aerodynamic, we still have to be able to deliver the power in those positions, in those aer um, aerodynamic positions. So I think you know the athlete, it's still ultimately the athlete that wins the medals, and we want to make sure that that's the case as much as possible. Okay, other questions? Yes. Suppose they have got uh, unlimited budgets, unlimited funds, uh, lots of sponsors. What sort of research would they do uh, or try next? Uh? Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll suggest we ask all four of them. And maybe we'll start um, with Jetsen. Yeah, I just see the results also one week ago or something, so I just check it out completely. Um, but I'm by myself already some years uh, uh, busy also with, with Guido to yeah make a lot of research and I'm first of all really really happy with this 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 guys all over the table because we really need it in paracycling and of course we have more par problems in paracycling with classification mm. and all, a lot of a lot of things uh, but I think the most important is we need a lot of information from all the different for sure also hand cycling uh, three wheels versus two wheels uh, normal cycling so yeah, I'm really happy and I will for sure read the whole research. Um, 
But again, I think it's uh, it's also different. Each athlete, I'm with with my team already many years working on aerodynamic uh, testing and and stuff like that. But I don't have the unlimited uh, budgets to test it all. So we have also uh, yeah find find the people and we can really use all this uh, this know-how. So yeah, it's really good and. I hope it's a start, it's not a finish, because uh, of course it's good information, but uh, difficult also in paracycling is it's all different bodies. They tell uh, every hand bike is different, every body is, is different, uh, empty or not. Or So uh, I think, uh, I hope it's, it's just a start and we have many work to do. So I hope, try to be part of it, but that guys are, I, I have to uh, put the watts on the bike and they can help me with the speed. Um, so yes, we 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 had we don't have any real results. We we don't have a report. We were there all day yesterday, but I think approximately five percent gain from the changes we made, which is just huge. It's it's massive. Now we haven't been able to implement that. We haven't been on a a track. We don't know if we can cycle or uh, output what we can in those positions. But to be able to get five percent in a day is just it's it's unfathomable you know um but we we learned for example our, the the tandem that we have is an aluminium frame um and we actually learned yesterday that when you sit on the bike the flex without cycling at all uh, actually compresses the frame and pushes it outwards uh, something we we just wouldn't have known that before and so if we had an unlimited budget we would obviously go and spend silly money getting a carbon fiber frame to be made like some nations can um but and and then maybe you could improve the aerodynamics of the frame itself on top of that um but again that's that's another day in the wind tunnel with a another another bike that's worth x amount you know but um yeah fantastic i think for me what i found yesterday was getting into these this what is a position similar to what you are already doing, but to then go home now over the next number of months and train on a stationary bike as I do as a para-athlete, for me, I all my training is on a stationary bike. That's common enough for sprinters, but particularly if you're a visually impaired rider. And as was said earlier, it would take years, if at all possible, to make a 5% gain in the gym. So to do that in one day is phenomenal. So. It's now taking that and putting it into practice and hopefully being able to work off and gain, get those results and be able to put out the power and uh, on the bike, on the track to get those gains. Because if we're doing a one kilometer, the one kilometer time trial is our uh, track event. It's going to be our event in Tokyo. So for us to take 5% today and put that in, in, in into action now over the next number of months and 18 months up to the games, that's huge with more work and um, you know if if other boys come along as Bert says come back here and, and, and learn more and get more gains you want to? yeah I mean I'll just say from a coaching perspective obviously you know the, the gain we identified yesterday was significant now it's over to the guys to be able to deliver their power um, in the real world scenario and th I think that's where additional testing becomes even more relevant because what happens in the wind tunnel, carrying it into the real world, see how that get, gets delivered in practice, then learning from that and coming back to, to, to adjust. So it's a process and certainly I'd echo what Yetza said, I hope it's the, the beginning rather than the end because it is a process of refinement ongoing over time um, and the, the potential is, is huge and I do think the, the job the guys have done here in opening opening the Pandora's box, as Owen said, but it's really shining a light on paracycling and giving people an insight as to how exciting the sport is and what, what a high performance um, sport it is. Um, I think it's only the start of it, and if we can come back and get another 5% later, I'd be uh, more than happy, and I hope that happens. <laughs> Yeah, I think so. Uh, at concerning your question, uh, are they are the athletes surprised or not? I think all of them went directly to saying, okay, about the tests uh, yesterday and in the future. And I think that's the right perspective uh, because what we did here was we scanned some bodies of some athletes. We put them on a, on a regular bike or on a, on a, a specific bike. 
and then you get numbers. Uh, like, for example, you get 4.5%. But then it's a, the matter of first, how much will this be different for one specific athlete with a different body? That can be 4.2, can be 4.8. And the other thing, indeed, like also all the, these uh, champions have been saying is like, okay, can we implement this with the same power output? And I think that uh, that in itself is, uh, yeah, I, I think extremely important. One thing, if, if anyone, uh, I'm not sure how many people here have actually been to paracycling events, but it would be worthwhile. Uh, like, you know, I have my, actually, funnily enough, some of my favorite events are not the endurance events, which is the ones I was actually good at. Uh, obviously, physically, I like those events because I was good at them, but in terms of watching them, uh, you know, the ha for me, the hand cycle racing is always exciting, uh, particularly the cornering in it is sometimes just unbelievable. See these guys going around corners. And... Uh, the kilometre sprint for the tandems, it's one of the races in Rio that I'll, I'll never forget. I think I was warming up for my own medal ride off for a pursuit event in there. And there were two two bikes, were the British and the Dutch, and these were the two favourites. And the Dutch went out and did, I think, one of the best rides I've ever seen in the bike. Did 59.7 seconds for the, the kilometre. And the British came out and obviously had to beat that, but missed it by a couple of hundredths of a second. And uh, when you see a tandem ro rolling around a track at 80 or 70 kilometers an hour, it's uh, definitely an exciting sight. So I'd recommend for anyone to go and, and see these events and see why we're enthusiastic about them. So actually the Track World Championships were actually in Appledorn and they just finished. And the next number of events um, in May, June and July will be a series of Road World Cups. There's Ostend and uh, for example, it's the closest one. There's also in Italy, and in um, Emmen in July is the Road World Championships, Neil? Pardon? In September, sorry, is, is the World World Championships. So that's, that's quite close. And again, that would be a great one to go and see the, the best athletes in action. Right, if there are no further questions at this moment, I suggest we, we go for lunch. That should not be too far. If everything went well, it's just outside here. And uh, afterwards, um, of course, also during lunch, if you want, you can ask questions and and uh, try interviews, but afterwards we'll uh, walk together to the wind tunnel hall, where then, uh, you know, yesterday we tested uh, Eamon and Martin, and then later uh, in the wind tunnel, uh, Jetsen's bike is already there, so also Jetsen will be uh, tested in the wind tunnel, and uh, also their photographs and footage will be made that we can send you later, but you can also, of course, make it uh, yourself if you want. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for being in the first part, and uh, enjoy lunch.